All right, well, I think we're just about ready to begin. Uh, so welcome everyone. I'm just scrolling through the participants list. I can see uh, a few familiar names. Uh, so those of you who I know, uh, good to see you here. Uh, those of you who I don't, uh, nice to virtually meet you. Um, before we begin, uh, just to remind you that this is being recorded. Uh, so I guess any considerations about that, um, you know, if you don't want to be in a recorded session, please leave. Uh, so I suspect it's only me who needs to be concerned about that. Uh, I'm happy to take questions at any point during this webinar. Uh, so if you put questions or comments in the chat window, not the Q&A, the chat window, uh, I'll be monitoring it uh, during the talk and I'll try to pick up on any points that, uh, that come up uh, through the talk. So uh, feel free to ask questions, make comments. Um, you know, I'm, I'm more than happy to uh, get a discussion going. Um, other than that, um, I guess if you haven't figured it out already, I'm Adam Hill. Uh, I'm at the University of Derby, uh, where I'm an associate professor of electroacoustics. Uh, when I'm not at the university, I've worked as a live sound engineer in the U.S., uh, primarily in the Chicago area, uh, for nearly 20 years now. Uh, so I kind of have um, a couple different hats that I wear. I have the academic hat and I have the live sound hat, um, hence... Uh, the subject of this talk, uh, which is sound exposure at live events, uh, measurement, monitoring, and management. So away we go. Um, so to give a bit of background of where what I'm talking about today came from, uh, it actually stems from some work that I've done with the Audio Engineering Society uh, in my uh, role as chair of the AES Technical Committee on Acoustics and Sound Reinforcement. Uh, so we developed uh, or created this working group uh, about three years ago after a conference in 2017 uh, that was in Denmark on sound reinforcement, uh, where I suppose through a lot of conversations, we realized that the procedures and the regulations throughout the world uh, focused on making sound exposure safe at live events and making sure that noise pollution in the community uh, stays under control. Uh, it's all a bit of a mess and you can be on a tour and every single tour date will have different rules and different procedures in place, which makes it very difficult uh, for any touring engineers. Um, and the extreme of that is if you go to the US, let's say you're touring in California, there's over 120 different regulations and rules uh, throughout the state uh, on noise pollution due to, due to outdoor events and music events. Uh, so if you can imagine, if you're on a tour, you really have to keep up with uh, what you're working to on that particular day. So our overall goal, you can see it on the screen, uh, is was to develop a set of recommendations outlining what needs to be done to address the issues of sound exposure, noise pollution, due to outdoor entertainment events with an emphasis on practical um, practicality and preservation of a high quality audience experience. So really what we were developing is not so much um, a set of guidelines, but more just identifying what we don't know uh, and what best practice is out there at the moment. Uh, what we didn't wanna do is say, well, we have to turn it down because that's really a non-starter. People don't go to events to listen to it quietly and politely. You know, people go for that kind of intense experience of, um, you know, kind of feeling the impact of the low frequency when it hits you and the light show and the video and being in a, a sea of people, uh, which probably seems a bit odd uh, at present uh, going to something like this. But, you know, pandemic aside, it was something that drew quite a few people. Uh, so we formed the group in February 2018. Uh, we ended up publishing an AES technical document in May 2020. Uh, where then from that, there's already been uh, a few bits of spin-off work uh, that have um, that have come out of it and that are in progress within the AES. So this is the cast of characters uh, who contributed to this. Uh, some may be familiar names, uh, others maybe not. Um, I'm not going to go through everyone here, but you can kind of get a sense that we had people from all different corners of industry. We have acoustic consultants, we have touring engineers, we have manufacturers, we have academics, uh, where really the idea was to get uh, as broad a set of input uh, into this document as possible. Um, so these are the, the core contributors to this AES technical document. Um, and then um, I mean, I, there are countless others who reviewed it before it was actually published. I think it went through about four or five different um, review cycles, intervision cycles. Um, it's still not done yet. I think within the next few years, we'll have to update it. Um, 
you know, since there's still more new information coming uh, almost by the day. So you can access the full report. Uh, it's about 150 pages. So, you know, very light bedtime reading. Uh, it's open access. Uh, so I put the URL uh, there um, if you want to access it. But this is just to give you a snapshot of what we cover. Uh, we talk about what the audience expectations are and what their experience is uh, in general uh, at outdoor events. Uh, we talk about sound system design, which I'll come back to uh, during this webinar because it's really important um, in terms of sound exposure of audience members. Uh, we did a fairly comprehensive review of noise regulations throughout the world, uh, where I got very close with uh, Google Translate in this process. Uh, so we, we really kind of ended up with a broad picture of what's going on worldwide in terms of noise regulations. Um, we went in a fair amount of detail into noise pollution prediction, uh, noise and sound measurement, monitoring and management. And there's a whole host of um, bits of good practice out there already um, that we drew upon. Uh, and then lastly, talked about noise suppression techniques. What can we do to keep the noise to a minimum uh, from these large scale outdoor events? So we're covering quite a broad ground here. Um, and like I said before, really what this report came up with were more questions than answers. Um, so it really points to quite a bit of further research that's needed, which I'll highlight today. Now, this AES work was happening, and in parallel with that, uh, there's, there was quite a bit of work and still is uh, within the World Health Organization uh, related to their Make Listening Safe initiative. Uh, now, the Make Listening Safe initiative, if you haven't come across it, uh, really has three primary goals. Uh, the first of which was to develop and implement uh, a joint global standard with the WHO and ITU for safe listening devices. Uh, so this has been completed. This was done uh, a couple of years ago, uh, where now you're starting to see things, uh, especially from kind of mobile phone manufacturers, where you have bits of software, primarily in Apple devices at the moment, where it actually tracks your um, noise exposure throughout a given day and gives you a bit of a warning if you may have been overexposed for uh, a given day. Um, so this is out there. Uh, it's been there for a couple of years. And I know some of the manufacturers have picked up on it. Um, in general, um, the kind of takeaway points is that there's a limit for adults. So 80 is DBA uh, over 40 hours per week. For children, it's 75 DBA over 40 hours per week. And so it's really drawn from kind of the occupational um, noise guidelines uh, that are out there. Now, the second goal of the Make Listening Safe initiative is really um, almost a public awareness campaign um, to try to inform people about why they should be protecting their hearing and also to hopefully um, kind of promote a change in behavior, uh, because it's been identified um, for quite some time now that we are on path for uh, a significant portion of the world's population to have hearing issues uh, within the next 20 years or so. Um, so I, I put a, a QR code here to one of their apps that they developed as part of this, which is um, uh, a hearing and noise test, which um, I don't know for the rest of you, but I go in um, to, to test my hearing. I do the, the standard audiology test audiometric test, and it comes back fairly perfect. But I know my hearing isn't perfect, um, but it's the hearing and noise tests that really reveal where my problems are. Um, I really struggle these days to, to pick out a conversation or, or anything specific in a noisy environment. Um, and, you know, it's kind of my own personal experience really kind of hammers home where the problem is. Um, you know, my hearing issues, I, I'm I say 75% of them stem from when I was a teenager and I was convinced I was going to be a rock musician for the rest of my life. I played really loud music almost every single day. Um, and since about the age of 17 or 18, I've had mild tinnitus um, and a bit of this um, hearing and noise issues, um, which haven't really gotten worse in all my work in live sound, because by then I was protecting my hearing and, and being sensible about it. So it's really something that um, the WHO are trying to tackle at young ages. Uh, which is quite difficult, um, considering that usually the social elements will outweigh uh, the health and safety elements when you're a teenager. I think we've all been there. Uh, the third goal for this Make Listening Safe initiative, which is the one that is still ongoing and most relevant to um, this webinar, uh, is that they're working to develop and implement a global standard for safe listening venues. 
So this is in the draft stage right now. Um, I'm, 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 I'm unable to tell you really anything about it at the moment, other than to say that the general plan is to, to get it out next year or sometime. Um, but the idea is that it's a global standard. It's not an enforceable standard, but it's something that the WHO hope that um, governments and authorities throughout the world will pick up on and uh, have it influence uh, their updated policies. Um, and really just to make going to live events safe uh, you know, and make sure that we're not completely destroying people's hearing by putting on these events. So I think it could have quite significant implications for the industry, some of which I'll talk about today. Um, and I just put the photo up here. This was the last time we were in Geneva. Um, for kind of an intensive uh, couple day session um, to, to work on this. This was in, let me get my year right now, it's all gone into a blur. It was 2020, February, 2020. So it was just as this pandemic was kind of starting to, to gain momentum. We were there at WHO headquarters talking about music venues where I'm pretty sure the rest of the building were talking about the pandemic. So we felt a little bit foolish um, focusing on this when when everything else was was kicking off then. But um, anyway, there you go. Right. So now to kind of the, the meat of this session. Um, really, this is, is going to be a series of questions that I'm putting out there. Um, and I'm drawing from the 25 questions that the AES technical document poses in its conclusion. So some of these I'll have partial answers to and hunches. Others uh, I'll leave fairly wide open uh, where it's really an opportunity for uh, further research to be done. And maybe some of you uh, on the webinar today can uh, pick up on it and collaborate and you know answer some of these questions. So I've split it into three broad categories. We have audience related questions, we have community related questions, and we have engineer related questions. Um, you'll notice that I don't have all 25 questions uh, posted today because uh, we simply don't have the time, but I've picked out, I think, the most relevant ones that um, would be of interest to all of you. So again, for those of you who join late, if at any point during this you um, have any questions or comments, put it in the chat box. Uh, and I'm monitoring that so um, I can uh, pick up on anything um, instead of waiting till the end. So audience questions. We'll start out with this one. So what's the best approach for measuring and monitoring audience sound exposure? Like I said at the beginning of this presentation, if you look at the regulations and guidelines throughout the world, there's quite a bit of disparity. There's, there's no one seems to agree on exactly how to do this. Although I think we're getting closer, especially in Europe, uh, but it's, it's still a bit of um, a question mark. Um, I put this photo up. This is from uh, a number of years ago. You can tell by the sound system. Um, this is an event I did, uh, I think just outside of Chicago, but it was kind of a skater fest. And you could see these kids, like the kid in the pink shirt, he was sitting there all day, probably about six hours or so, right in front of one of the speakers. Um, so my colleague, Rob, you could see him there with uh, the cheapo Radio Shack sound level meter, um, trying to figure out how loud it was where these kids were sitting. Um, and the answer is that the Radio Shack sound level meter doesn't go that high. Uh, so um, it's uh, yeah, a bit of a, a worrying thing. Even back then, we we're like, okay, this can't be very good. Um, so what can I say about this? Well, um, looking at the data capture, so the sound level capture method, uh, the question is what's the best measurement location? So if you look at a lot of the guidelines and regulations out there today, they'll say that the best spot to measure from, you know, identify the loudest part of the audience and measure from there. That's a bit vague because, okay, if I'm using A-weighted measurements, then sure, I can find the loudest point. It's probably somewhere closest to one of the line arrays. Um, so nearer the front of the audience, but maybe not perfectly in front of the audience where you don't get coverage from the main array. Or if I said, well, I'm gonna measure with DBC, then it'll almost certainly be right front row center. If you have ground-based subwoofers, you're just gonna be absolutely pummeled with low frequency. So it's kind of a question of what, is the loudest point? What do you mean by loudest? And the language is vague in a lot of the guidelines. Not all of them, some of them are more specific, but a lot of them are completely vague. Now, if you say, okay, let's just say for instance, front row center, that's where you're gonna measure from. That's fine, but do you want a measurement mic or a sound level meter there for a whole event? 
I don't think so. Um, so the question then is what's the most practical location? And what's typical is that you measure before the people come in at your identified loudest point uh, in the audience and then measure at the mixed position, which you can see in the picture here at the front of house riser, uh, measure the difference between those two and then you can apply a correction to your measurements. So you can monitor in real time at the mixed location. Uh, so your microphone is safe um, you know, and not gonna be um, you know, bare and whatnot spilled all over it and still get an idea of what's happening at the loudest part of the audience. Um, it also helps to be slightly away from the audience because um, with uh, researchers I've worked with, some of their data has logged audience screaming levels at uh, roughly, I think it was either 112 or 118 dBA. So audience can get loud, especially at teen pop events. Uh, and I've been there and it's one of the loudest things I've ever heard in my life, the audience screaming. So you don't want your measurement microphone immersed in the audience. You want a little bit of distance away from that to avoid um, completely skewing your data. Um, and on that point, I mean, should we distinguish between controllable and uncontrollable sound level data? And I don't mean ignoring it, but I mean maybe marking it in your um, log files of the sound level saying that, okay, this data was this sound level, this is from what's coming out of the PA and is fully under your control or this data, which is clearly from the audience screaming. Um, and you can kind of monitor that by monitoring the output of the mixing desk. Um, so there's some discussion there just to show, especially um, people who are regulating this. Okay, yeah, we were in breach of this limit for this amount of time, but we can show you that this was the audience. This had nothing to do with the sound system. Um, I think that's important to at least have that data available so you can show it. Um, and then, you know, I, I should mention that, especially in Europe, there are legal requirements now uh, in many places to be logging your sound level data um, and make putting it in a tamper-proof file and submitting that to, um, to the local authorities so they can check in case there are any issues. Um, so, you know, there is good reason to, to really nail this down and, and get this right. Um, I just see a couple... Um, a couple comments already. This is kind of going back a few minutes. Um, yeah, the U.S. has different rules in different states. It's even worse than that, actually. Um, they have different rules within uh, a single state. Like I said, with California, there's over 100 different uh, rules within that single state. And then you go to the state of Wyoming, and there's no rules. There's no law on the books at all in the state of Wyoming for noise. Um, and then uh, John says, no category for performers. That's an interesting one, um, and one that's come up quite a bit in our discussions with the WHO, where we do have musicians involved in these talks as well. Um, and I think from the AES perspective for that work, we've omitted performers because we're, we understand that from an engineer perspective, if you're touring with a band, you're working close with the performers um, and you, know, you have an understanding of what they're after um, and kind of how that will work within um, safe limits. Uh, so that's why we don't have an individual performers category, but um, you're quite right to say that they do need to be considered because you will get quite a bit of pushback from performers if you're not meeting their expectations. Okay, so moving on. Um, let's look at the data analysis now. Um, Oh, and yeah, Alex says, surely noise exposure of musicians and bands fall under noise at work regulations. Um, I believe technically, yes, uh, but, you know, especially for outdoor events, I've never once seen any enforcement of that at all. Um, even more of a concern for me would be the security guards who stand typically right alongside a 20, 30 meter long wall of subwoofers for their entire shift. Um, and I, I'm quite concerned about what they're being exposed to. Uh, so, um, so yeah, it's, uh, there's quite a bit to consider there, but I really don't want to open up that can of worms here. But yes, I think the occupational regulations do apply if you're working the event. Uh, but in my experience, I've never seen any of that enforced. Uh, so for data analysis, um, especially from an engineer point of view, uh, it's really important to get your data analysis right. And I've shown just a, a simple um, example of uh, a simple moving average. Uh, so looking at sound level data um, over different effectively averaging times. So this is LEQ data that's been synthesized. Um, and I've just given um, three sample 
um, or virtual band performances. So the first band is at about 96 dB, second band is at 90 dB, and the third band is at 100 dB. Um, and just showing with, okay, five minute LEQ, 15 minute LEQ, 30 minute and 60 minute LEQ, what information that's presenting to the engineer. Now, for the five minute, it takes about five minutes to get an idea of what level you're operating at. If you go for 60 minute, which is common for many regulations out there, say for this first band set, they only played 45 minutes. So they're not gonna get any accurate information from this monitoring. And actually the next band on who's quieter than the first band, the level that they're seeing on the monitoring software is actually gonna be about five dB above what they're actually operating at. Not only that, about 45 minutes into their set, it will dip below what their actual level is. So they may say, okay, well, I can push it up a little bit because I'm not at my, my usual level. And then it creeps up again. Um, and that's all due to the, the break between bands, which is the grayed out area uh, in this plot. Um, so I'm not saying to move away from the simple moving average. I'm just saying, be aware of the limitations. And if you're an engineer in control uh, of mixing a band, uh, the longer integration times are problematic because you're not getting relevant and timely information. So it's kind of a bit of guesswork at that point. And we'll come back to that in a little bit. Um, so yeah, the general consensus, and I'll show some, some evidence of this uh, among sound engineers, is that a uh, simple moving average above a 15 minute in integration time really isn't practical. Uh, now you could say, let's look at something else. Let's look at say an exponential moving average. So I've shown you an example here where um, I've plotted the 15 minute simple moving, moving average, the SMA, uh, along with a 60 minute uh, exponential moving average that has been calibrated to mimic the responsiveness of the 15 minute. SMA. Uh, so you can see it follows a very similar trend and gives you timely information while still factoring in the full 60 minutes of sound level information. Um, I'm not saying that this is ever going to get into any standards or regulations. I don't think it will, but I think this could be an interesting tool for sound engineers to use as uh, a secondary sound level monitor to give them at least a bit more timely information. Um, and I'll come back to that in just a minute, uh, but it's an interesting alternative that um, uh, myself and a, a few collaborators, uh, research collaborators have been toying around with recently. Um, Talal asks, how about the noise from the audience? Um, it kind of goes back to what I was talking about uh, in terms of our data capture. Um, if you could monitor the sound level coming out uh, of the desk, uh, then you could say in your log file, well, these sound levels logged were a direct relation to um, the sound coming out of the PA. And then otherwise, if you're not getting anything out of the desk, um, it's what you is coming from the audience. Um, so um, it's one way to distinguish, but I should point out that within regulations, uh, they don't distinguish between that. Uh, your sound exposure is the sound exposure, regardless of whether it came out of the PA or the audience. I think we just have to keep note of um, what, is, um, what is in our control and what isn't. Okay, so here's an example of something that we've come up with um, for data analysis. Let's say, could we use the SMA and EMA, exp exponential moving average data, to predict LEQ? So let's say you're working with um, a 60 minute uh, integration time for LAEQ. Is there a way to use the current data to actually predict what's going to happen? So we did this, um, and I'm not going to kind of give it all away because it's coming up in um, a Journal of the Audio Engineering Society paper. Um, uh, that should be coming out within the next couple of months, how we did this. But we basically combined SMA and EMA data to give, uh, in this example, a 15 minute look ahead. Uh, so you can see the kind of squiggly line over the top. That's the raw data coming in um, from the performance. This is real data. Uh, the dotted line is what our prediction is for LAEQ 60 minutes. Uh, and then this, the gray line um, is what the LAEQ 60 minutes actually was. Uh, and then I've shifted in the black line, the prediction, time shifted it over to see how close it was. So aside from that kind of five minute uh, kind of ramp up period, um, it, it's actually pretty much bang on um, the, uh, what the reality. Um, so what that gives is it gives an engineer, in this case, a 15 minute warning saying, if you keep on this trajectory, 
you're going to um, to exceed the limit and have a limit violation. Um, so it, it's something that could be useful if you're if a long integration time is imposed upon you. Um, kind of on on that topic, uh, user interface is absolutely critical to get right. Um, one thing that we found uh, in certain cases, and I'll come to this a little bit later, uh, is that if the user interface is displayed in an incorrect way, you could cause engineers to actually mix to the limit. So if they couldn't have sight of the sound level monitoring system, they may mix quite quieter, but if they see the monitoring and know they can go up to say 98 dB, they tend to go up to 98 dB uh, in certain cases. On top of that, if the sound level monitoring is visible to the audience, uh, it could become a competition. You know, let's see how loud uh, we can make it. Let's see if we can make all the red lights go on. And you get things like that um, at say American basketball games. You know, if I go back to the Chicago and go to a Bulls game, it's been kind of a staple of the experience in that where they put the sound level meter on and see how loud they can get the crowd uh, to go. You know, and it's a bit of a competition. And what we don't want is this to um, kind of filter over to live events where um, you know the crowd can see the sound level and kind of does everything they can to kind of pressure things to to get louder and louder. Uh, one thing I've already mentioned uh, is secondary LEQ monitoring. So you may have your official limit and it may be say LAEQ 60 minutes of 100 dB. Um, what a lot of engineers will then do is say, okay, I can't work with a 60 minute averaging window. I'm gonna work with a secondary limit of 15 minutes, uh, which will get them more timely information uh, and just ensure that they can comply with the longer limit. Um, by getting kind of more timely data um, accessible to them so they can work. Yeah, you know, 15 minutes is about two or three songs in a live set. So that's a long enough period where um, you can capture kind of a, a decent average, but a short enough period where you can make adjustments quite quickly. Now, taking this to the extreme, um, one person I've collaborated with quite a bit on research is uh, Michael Lawrence at Rational Acoustics. Uh, and he's developed this method of having multiple time frames uh, for LEQ monitoring. And you can see an example that, that he provided for me um, down here where you have a 10 second LAEQ, a one minute LAEQ, um, and if I move this window, a 15 minute LAEQ. And he basically uses it. You can almost see it as like an LED ladder. So if you're mixing really loud, the first thing to go yellow and then red will be the 10 second monitor. If you keep up that loud uh, burst of noise, the one minute will go. And then if you really keep it up for a long period of time, um, the 15 minute will go. So it's almost this LED ladder of loudness where for short term, legally, you can get away with it, uh, but you don't want to be holding at that level. Um, otherwise, you run into some legal issues. Um, let's see, Alistair says 15 and one minute uh, limits more useful for managing a varying performance? Um, that's actually a really good question, and I'm glad you brought it up because um, it ties into a paper that, uh, well, a series of papers that I'll, I'll reference to at the end of this talk um, within the JAES, uh, where we've looked at um, live musical dynamics. Uh, and what we found was that if you use a one minute averaging window, you tend to be riding your faders on the mix quite a bit. So your dynamics, kind of the difference between the loudest thing in the performance and the quietest, tend to get squashed in the middle because you can't have these sharp peaks anymore if you have a really short time averaging. Uh, <coughs> so it's kind of the 15 minutes we landed on because it's more of a, a compromise between being able to use dynamics um, within the performance, which is important from the audience experience, but um, a, a, balance between that and having timely information. And if we went much beyond that, yeah, if you use 60 minutes, you can have all sorts of dynamics, but it's not useful for the engineer. Um, so yeah, it, it's a good question. Uh, I think one minute is far too short, uh, although there are parts of the world where they do impose a one minute average, um, which makes it uh, interesting to say the least. Uh, and that leads quite nicely onto this last little point I make, You know, could we take a dynamics-based approach uh, where, instead of mixing to here's our LEQ number, could we almost have a mask for live musical dynamics? And say, okay, here's your mask for this genre, uh, incorporating this LAQ limit. Once you fill up this kind of histogram mask, 
you're done. You've used up all of your sound capital, so to speak. Um, just an idea. It, it hasn't really been fleshed out for anything, but maybe something to, to poke around with uh, in further research. Okay, um, so the second question, building on that is what is uh, an appropriate sound exposure limit for the audience? So here's just a snapshot of, uh, this is from our AES technical report of um, Europe and what audience limits they have in place. Now, a lot of these have at least originated with WHO work, uh, largely going back to the 1999 guidelines for community noise. Uh, we were excited when we were putting together this AES report because kind of right when we were doing all that work, um, the WHO released uh, the 2018 environmental noise guidelines for Europe. And there was a section in there for leisure noise, which we fall under. Um, and then it was really disappointing when we opened up uh, the document and looked through it. And they said, well, we can't really make any new recommendations because there's a complete lack of unbiased scientific research in this field, uh, which is, is a bummer to say the least, uh, but it, it really kind of spurred us on, on the AES side to say, okay, we really need to identify what these areas are that, that need addressing. Um, and it's also kind of then fed into the Make Listening Safe initiative which it, within the WHO. Um, for the limits in Europe, uh, you can see they all have primary limits that are A-weighted. So it's not really factoring in the low frequency content, which I can understand the reasoning behind this. I mean, you go back to medical research and it's been, you know, 80, 70, 80 years of using DVA measurements. So that's where the data is. That's where the research is. Hence why all our primary limits are A-weighted because that's the best evidence that we have of what causes hearing damage. Uh, but I mean, just look at the first two entries. So in parts of Austria, you have a hundred dBA LEQ limit, but your integration time is one minute. Now, if you go over to Belgium, you're still at the hundred dBA limit, but your integration time is 60 minutes. So if you went to those shows on a tour back to back, you'll have completely different experiences. 100 dBA average over one minute is gonna result in a much quieter, less dynamic show than 100 dBA over 60 minutes. They're not the same thing at all, um, which is, is fairly shocking that even within a very similar region of Europe, they have such um, different regulations. Uh, you can see in France, they're at 15 minutes, as are the Netherlands. Uh, Norway's at 30 minutes. Uh, you know, in other places, it's the event duration. So it's really all over the shop. Um, one of the encouraging things, though, is, for instance, in France and the Netherlands and Sweden and Switzerland, they have separate limits for children's events. So actually, it is recognizing that you know, we do need to protect the hearing of children who may not be quite as aware of the risks that they're taking. Um, now, what is interesting is that some of these regulations do have a secondary limit. Now, that may be a secondary A-weighted limit for LAEQ um, for a shorter time frame. And I know in Belgium, um, one of my colleagues, Marcel Koch, uh, has uh, been instrumental in getting this in place, uh, where within the regulations, it's recognized that sound engineers can't work with 60-minute averaging. Um, so they've actually added, okay, you can go up to 102 dBA LAEQ um, for 15 minutes. Um, and that's also kind of within um, the regulations now. Uh, other countries have a C-weighted limit, um, which again, it's really all over the shop. Uh, from the research I've done, uh, it seems to be that certain these C regulations are less based in scientific fact and more just a number that came up through a, a compromise via committee. Um, and you go to some places and your show is extremely hampered because the C limit is just um, unworkable. So it's really all over the place um, and there's certainly room for improvement. The problem with C weighting is that there's really minimal uh, research out there to show okay, at what point is this becoming a hearing health issue? Uh, it just isn't really known. Everything is with DBA. So, uh, and that's what the WHO have made clear. They can't really recommend a clear C-weighted limit aside from peaks um, because the information is not out there. So it's interesting. Um, Alex asks, uh, globally for large-scale touring systems, how prevalent are the configuration of peak limiters as part of the system's DSP for the purpose of complying with the limits? Um, from my experience, you have peak limiters to protect the sound system, 
from overload. Uh, but again, in my experience, I've never seen a peak limiter in place to it, that's in relation to the limits. I have heard of some uh, permanent music venues who have things like this in place um, where the engineers who've worked there don't necessarily have good things to say about it. Um, but I think that's that's sort of a separate discussion. But but yeah, an interesting question. You know, if we put kind of a limiter in place for um, for the uh, for the uh, limits imposed. Um, so yeah, interesting one to think about. Uh, ooh, we've got something in Q and A as well. Um, yes, we'll have some moments for questions after the presentation. Yes, I've just seen that. Okay, um, one regulation I just want to quickly point out is in Germany. It's actually not a regulation or a law, but it's a technical standard um, that limits it to 99 dB LAEQ with um, over 30 minutes and a 135 dBc peak. Uh, they say, as I've already said, measure the loudest audience position, whatever that may be. Again, it's a bit ambiguous, uh, where they do encourage right, uh, relative measurements. So measure at your loudest point and measure at the mixed location and apply a correction to the mixed location. But what is interesting about this one is that this is the only place in the world, to my knowledge, this is happening, but this technical standard is being used in legal cases where members of the audience are successfully suing uh, the event organizers for hearing damage. Uh, and this worries me massively. Uh, as a live event engineer, a live sound engineer, I don't want to go down this this path of worrying about is someone going to be suing the event organizers for something I'm responsible for. Uh, so this is really worrying that this is um, creeping into legal cases. And it's not even a law, it's a technical standard, but I think there are at least half a dozen cases now that have been successful uh, in suing event organizers for sound exposure. Um, Mike says, are C weighted limits an attempt to reduce the long distance, low frequency impact of events? Um, not for what I've been talking about here. Um, that comes up when you talk about the community side of things, uh, which again, uh, we'll get to that uh, a bit later, but it, it's again, a bit murky in that area to say the least. Uh, okay, moving on. Um, this is actually some fresh data that we have. Uh, so we used uh, the fact that sound engineers were not engineering uh, during the pandemic. Uh, and a lot of them that we knew were, were sitting at home looking for things to do, especially in the early days. So we decided to conduct a survey of live sound engineers in 2020, uh, where we got uh, over 2000 responses and about 1700 of those we call complete. I put the, the quote marks around it because what we considered were complete were if they answered 80% or more of the questions. Uh, and our uh, responses came from uh, across 63 countries. And I'm only going to extract one um, table from this. The rest will be published very soon um, in the Audio Engineering Society Journal. But this is just polling sound engineers on what averaging time is they think is best to do their job and what metric is best to do their job. Um, you can see the vast majority answered 15 minutes LAEQ, which isn't surprising because that's what most of them will be most familiar with because uh, most regulations are based on that. Uh, still a good proportion were saying LCEQ, uh, 15 minutes was a good idea. There were a few saying more short-term LC peak should be used or LA max. Uh, other typically represented people suggesting a combination of two or more. Um, so you can kind of see where the engineers have um, kind of placed themselves and what they prefer to use, uh, where it seems that LAQ is still most popular because it's familiar uh, and somewhere between five and 15 minutes is preferred. So there'll be more on this uh, coming up uh, in a, a publication very soon. Um, right, oh, we got another question. Uh, we're gonna pick some small parties on the soundscape for residential neighborhoods. So what do I think about these numbers? Um, we'll get to we'll get to that when I get to the community question. So maybe hold tight with that one for a little bit. Um, the fifth question that came out of this, or um, it's not the fifth one we've talked about today, but the fifth in the AES report. Um, what are the physiological and physiological uh, effects, psychological and physiological effects of high levels of infrasound um, that you get at outdoor events? Well. This is the one where there's little to no research on. Um, there are some conflicting reports. Uh, we did quite a wide literature review for this. 
uh, found some really old work that seemed to be testing humans up to 170 dB, which is a bit worrying. Um, these days, there's no way that you can do that ethically. Um, it's just not going to happen. Um, but we found in the research that's out there some very conflicting reports. Um, some people said with infrasound that we would encounter at live events, you get a heightened sensitivity. Other people says it does the opposite and gives you drowsiness, fatigue. Um, there are a few people that say there's some link to the runner's high where that thumping bass almost becomes addictive and releases endorphins in your brain after a certain amount of time. Kind of gives you a high that might be become addictive, uh, similar to running a marathon. You kind of get to the halfway point and that constant pace, all of a sudden you feel great um, after that halfway point when the endorphins start to release and kind of dull the senses a bit. Um, and then if, if you look at the lab uh, animal-based experiments, again, you know, I'm not going to go into the ethical implications of this, but they did find neurological deterioration for long-term low-frequency exposure um, at very similar levels to what we experience at live events. Um, and it's not just neurological, it's pretty much every system in the body um, is negatively affected um, within these tests. But there's a lot more work that's needed here. Uh, it's just a question of how. How do we do this work? Um, and I suspect it has to be a long-term study with volunteers who are going to be going to events anyway. Um, you know, you, you monitor no, no noise dose uh, and have them do surveys over a long period of time uh, to get an idea. I can't see any other way of doing it ethically. Uh, but obviously, if you have any ideas, uh, feel free to share or get in touch with me. I just wanted to point out some example data. Um, this is from uh, a couple years back uh, at an outdoor music fest that I did uh, in Chicago. Um, I took a relative measurement. So I measured at the front row of the audience before people got there. And then I monitored throughout the event at front of house and did the correction. Um, and this is looking at LC peak data uh, over the three days of the event. So each graph is a different day of the event, Friday, Saturday, and Sunday. Um, the blue is the raw LC peak. The red is the five minute average of that data. Um, and then in the title of each plot, you can see the maximum LC peak that the audience had in the front row uh, every day. And every day it was roughly 140 dBC, um, where the peaks were generally sitting between 110 and 130 dB. For the headliners, you were creeping up towards 140 on some days. Uh, and the five minute average was somewhere typically around 120 dBC. So, I mean, the takeaway is that it's loud. It's loud. I mean, I've stood there before for a short period of time. Your eyes are rattling. You feel a bit nauseous. Uh, I mean, it, to me, it's not a good place to stand. Uh, but, you know, the best fans, the, the band's biggest fans are typically standing in those areas to be as close to the action as possible. Um, so we do need to research this more to see, okay, what's the point at which this becomes seriously damaging? Um, and there's some academics I've spoken to who said it's not a problem. You don't get hearing damage or any other damage from this, uh, to which my response is, I just don't believe you. You know, Show me the evidence of that. I don't believe you. Uh, but we need more, um, more research in this area, really, because um, it is a huge hole uh, in our knowledge right now, uh, unless there's something out there that I'm unaware of. Uh, so please let me know if I've missed something. Um, Considering this, uh, does standard hearing protection help us, uh, especially in terms of the low frequencies that we're uh, being exposed to if you're near the front of an audience area? Uh, we had to go to NASA on this for the AES report. Uh, luckily, um, one of the people on our team uh, is an acoustic consultant for NASA, so was able to give us quite a bit of information. Um, NASA has been looking into this since the Apollo program, uh, and now they've had a renewed interest in this because they're looking into safety standards for deep space missions. Um, effectively, what they say in their current documents uh, for um, safe flights is for low frequencies that are looking between one and 80 hertz, which isn't miles away from what we're talking about at live events. Maybe we'd be talking about you know, 20 to 100 hertz for us. Um, they say unweighted 145 dB uh, Z peak uh, for any one third active band and then overall uh, over the low frequency spectrum, a limit of 150 dB Z, so unweighted. Um, they do say that if your energy concentration is around 50 to 60 hertz, look out because that's where your chest of an adult tends to resonate and causes whole body vibration, which leads to annoyance uh, and or discomfort, which 
if you look at live music, we tend to have most of our low frequency energy ex energy exactly in that region, which um, again, gives a bit of a concern. Um, so what NASA says is you can't just use earplugs for this because your whole body is vibrating. And I know the transfer of energy between the airborne energy and your body vibration isn't as effective as going through your ears. But you know, when we're talking 130, 140 dBC at live events, some of that must be getting in and then traveling up to your ears, not to mention whatever it's doing for the rest of your body. Um, and Marcus says, yeah, infrasound studies from wind turbines. Um, I've looked into those and there's some really interesting stuff in there. Um, so yeah, that that has kind of fed into some of this work. Uh, I am aware of a lot of that, but it's yeah, some very interesting research uh, out there on the wind turbine side of things. So yeah, thanks for thanks for bringing that up. Um, so carrying on, um, this is the last bit for the audience. Um, and then I think I do need to accelerate a little bit. Um, tendency to ramble on about this stuff. Um, what should be done to best educate audiences about the risks of sound exposure? You know, they're not going to stop coming, but you know, what can we do to at least make them kind of dial into the fact that maybe we need to at least think about this uh, a little bit. So I'm not going to address this now, but it, it's something that I know the WHO are, are thinking about quite seriously uh, right now. Okay, so that's it for the audience. Um, now moving on to community, which I know isn't the central focus of, um, of this talk, but I think it's interesting to at least... Uh, to pick up on some issues related to um, the sound that's coming on site and what's traveling off site. So, community. Well, what's the best practice to achieve a high quality audience listening experience while minimizing the off site noise? Um, and I just gave um, a couple plots here from uh, a paper from the IOA's Reproduce Sound a few years back. Uh, this is from the guys at Rocket Science in Switzerland, uh, talking about the secondary um, subwoofer systems that they've deployed at European events in an attempt to effectively uh, use active noise cancellation to limit the noise spill uh, into local neighborhoods. Um, so you can see the blue dots uh, in the right plot are showing the secondary sound system that was using active noise cancellation to try to limit um, the spread of low frequency noise. Uh, so you see these sort of systems popping up. We'll come back to it in a little bit because uh, I'm not entirely convinced that they're as effective as they uh, appear to be. Um, but it, it's certainly, at least from an engineering perspective, it's a very interesting uh, option. So we'll come back to that in a second. Um, but on the noise control side of things, and this might be something that some of you uh, in the room may be able to um, probably inform me a bit more on. Uh, but when you're trying to plan for noise control, you know, is there a practical method to predict and correct for the effects of sound refraction or is it uncontrollable? Uh, there's a really good piece of software that was a joint effort between SoundPlan and DMB Audio Technic called NoiseCalc that came out a number of years ago that allows us sound engineers to import our sound system designs to NoiseCalc, where it then will give us a prediction of um, of noise pollution uh, in the local area. And you can you know, use either the ISO uh, standard or Nord 2000 um, to kind of fine tune your model and put different wind conditions, different temperature and humidity uh, and whatnot. But from my experience doing live events, the wind shifts, the temperature changes. Um, so, you know, what's working during the day might be completely unusable at night. Um, and anyone who's done noise monitoring for live events has, has experienced this. So. I know of a few people who are working on this right now, uh, more on kind of the, the physical modeling side of things. But um, I think it's a big question that uh, that needs a bit more looking into to see if it is possible for us to, to have a bit better prediction uh, in this sense. Um, what's the most accurate and practical method for predicting noise annoyance in the community? Um, interestingly, I saw there was a, an Acoustical Society of America, America paper that just came out uh, going into this, going into annoyance in the community, which you know, I saw the title of it. I'm like, oh, this is great. You know, this might give me some more information. And I looked through it and there's not a single mention of music in there, where I understand that music is probably a very small set of, you know, uh, annoying noises where, you know, you're looking at traffic noise and industrial noise um, and whatnot. That tends to be a more persistent form of annoyance. Uh, but yeah, it was a bit of a, a letdown that um, uh, yeah, they didn't even mention it uh, in the paper. Um, this was kind of compiling, I think, about 20 years of work in the area. So what do we know? Um, there are quite a few suggestions 
in terms of the music side of things of how to quantify and predict an audience. Uh, the standard seems to be uh, that most people will use is if you have greater than 20 dB difference between dBA and dBC or Z in some cases, that has a risk of being annoying. Um, in our literature review for the AES, we came ac across the, a model that Zwicker uh, published uh, a number of years ago that kind of incorporates loudness and sharpness, roughness and fluctuations and strength of a signal to predict annoyance, which seemed quite good to me. Uh, but from asking around, people say, well, we didn't implement it because it seemed too complicated. Um, which I think this day and age, I'm not sure that's a good enough reason. Uh, so maybe that needs revisiting from the, the live music side of things to see if that could give us some good clues. Um, NASA looks at relative duration and level. Basically, if you start with a loud sound and then go to a quieter sound, even if it's a few dB quieter, the quieter sound will then be less annoying. And that, could, that also has an effect, even if the loud sound only happens for a short period of time, you're almost kind of conditioned then to be less annoyed by the quieter sound, which may persist for a long time. It's interesting. Um, some people say absolute C or Z weighted might be useful. Absolute A weighted, I've read some studies on that and they seem to contradict themselves within the first few paragraphs, um, where one in particular, um, it was clear that they had their conclusions set before they even did the experiment. So I'm a bit skeptical about that, um, but I, I'm happy to be proven wrong. Um, there's one study that I do like to highlight because it is one of the few that actually specifically looks at music. Uh, this was done by the Environmental Protection Agency, um, uh, the Danish Environmental Protection Agency uh, about 20 years ago, where they tested a whole host of typical um, noise that you get uh, in, in your home. Um, and they kind of mocked up uh, a fake um, kind of home setting and then basically tested it on people to see how annoyed they would get. And the takeaway message is that the two most annoying sounds were a drop forge and a discotheque. So music was the second most annoying thing only to the drop forge, um, where I think at 35 dBA, it was over, about 95% of the participants said the music was very annoying. And these tests they did were, were well below most regulations for, for noise. So I found that really interesting. It was one of the few times that music was really highlighted as, yeah, this is pretty annoying. Um, from a practical point of view, and this is kind of going back to live events, what we do know is that communication is essential. So some, a lot of the times for live events, it's very difficult for us to fully comply with any community noise uh, guidelines and laws. But if you communicate with those local community members, so pre-warn them that an event's happening and what you're doing to limit the, uh, the noise going into their property and who they can get in touch with during the event if they have a problem, uh, it goes a long way uh, and gives them some sense of control over the noise. They can call someone and talk to a human and say, it's too loud at my house. And that person will say, okay, we're going to do something about it. Uh, and in many cases, even if nothing's done about it, that person has been heard, they've gotten a response that's made them happy and their annoyance tends to go down. Uh, SPL track in the UK takes it a step further. We're at front of house, you have this real time map and you can see in real time, the complaints popping up on the map. So if all your complaints are clustered in one area relative to the stage, you say, okay, I might need to adjust uh, the speakers that are facing that direction. Um, and on top of that, the people complaining can actually message the front of house position directly and get a direct response, which again, gives them some sense of control and being listened to, which tends to lower annoyance. So it seemed like actually a very interesting system. Um, it gives kind of direct link to those in charge. Uh, DB Control in the Netherlands, um, they promote sound guards. Uh, so they have a member of staff at these massive European festivals who are in charge of this, uh, of monitoring the sound levels and managing it. And they ensure that there's good communication between all the key stakeholders. They're kind of the central point there. Where again, all three of these companies, Vanguardia, SBL Track, and DB Control, find that with good communication, your complaints go down significantly without doing anything to the actual sound system design. So it's really important to keep that in mind. Uh, is it possible to standardize noise monitoring practices? I mean, I've spoken about this already at the beginning of the talk. 
I think it is possible, uh, but it's going to be a long process working towards it. Um, I've put a reference up here to one of Marcel Cox's uh, previous AES papers on it, kind of looking at the phases of noise monitoring. Uh, but I don't have enough time right now to uh, to get into it because we are running short on time. Um, and another uh, issue is um, room modes. So if noise enters your residence and it happens to hit a room mode, it could be boosted by 10 to 20 dB. So how do we deal with that? I don't know, more research is needed. Uh, and then you also, some companies provide these in-room noise cancellation devices such as rocket science. My question is how effective are they? There's no data on them that I can see out there, but they're meant to cancel out this noise pollution from live events. But um, I think it's early days yet uh, with these. So um, there's still a bit of a question mark. Okay, um, I don't have much time left. Uh, so I'm just gonna breeze through this stuff. Although to me, this is some of the most ex uh, uh, exciting stuff. Uh, there's a question, do flown subwoofer systems cause greater noise pollution offsite? Um, if so, what they, can they do to avoid this issue? Um, if you look at Amsterdam, Amsterdam has in law that you can't fly your subwoofers. They have to be on the ground. And this is entirely due to a faulty experiment that was run, that was commissioned by the city of Amsterdam um, to be run. Uh, they didn't test any flown subwoofers in that test, but the conclusion was that you shouldn't fly subwoofers because they create greater noise pollution. Um, just gave you a few snapshots from a recent paper from uh, the people at L Acoustics. Uh, this was in the latest uh, AES con uh, convention, where they seem to show that between ground-based subwoofers and flown subwoofers, there's not much difference. And actually, the variability in SPL due to temperature gradients in the air uh, is significantly less, say, if you have a source height of 8 meters as compared to 0.5 meters. Uh, so they're actually showing the opposite, that you actually have more control when flying your subwoofers. Um, not to mention, if you fly the subwoofers, then you don't have audience members in the front row being absolutely pummeled with sound, which I think is a good thing. Uh, so there is research happening in this area, and um, I think we still need more to really hammer home this point that flown subwoofers aren't a bad thing. On that point, uh, I mean, can the same audience experience be achieved with uh, flown subwoofers? Again, L Acoustics have done this work a few years ago. On the left, this is ground-based subwoofer system showing uh, a 30 dB difference, roughly from front to back of the audience. The centrally flown system shows a 6 dB uh, difference from front to back. And I think that's all you need to know. Um, if your venue can accommodate it, fly the subwoofers and you get a much more consistent audience experience. Uh, we could use virtual base. So if you identify the fact that a certain band is causing noise pollution issues, you can actually notch out a few dB of that frequency and replace it with virtual base, which is a psychoacoustical effect to trick your brain into thinking there's more low frequencies there um, than there actually are. And this has been um, put into a product um, by uh, Event Acoustics in the Netherlands called Base Creator, um, which actually uses some research that I did with uh, Malcolm Hawksford about 10 years ago onto uh, this. So the reference is there um, if you want to look it up. Um, another bit of interesting work that I think needs a, a bit more investigation is from my, one of my colleagues at Darby now, uh, John Burton. Uh, he actually did his dissertation up at York, his master's dissertation, uh, looking at exchanging preferred listening level with bandwidth of low frequency systems. And he found that if you extend your bandwidth, your preferred listening level went down. Um, so, you know, there, it's a bit noisy results and a bit more research needed, but I think it's intriguing. Uh, from an audience safety perspective, that's a good thing. If you can lower things a couple dB, great. From a noise pollution perspective, it could be problematic because the infrasound is much more difficult to control than um, just your, your standard low frequencies, kind of 25, 30 hertz and above. Um, how effective are secondary sound systems, these active noise cancellation systems for actually limiting low frequencies spilling into the community? Um, there is some evidence. Rocket Science have done a bit of work on it and published some results. Uh, within the Monica project at DTU, they've been doing a lot of work on it and again, showing some encouraging results. My question is always what's happening above the ground plane? If there's a high rise apartment block on the other side of the street, are those subwoofers doing anything to cancel low frequency noise? Uh, and I don't think they are, but no one's done the measurements. So I think more work is needed to really drill down uh, into how good these systems could be. And I know there's work in progress on that um, as we speak. 
uh, and I think this is the last one, um, is automatically mixing to the sound level limit a real effect? Uh, I mentioned the Australian study at small music venues, uh, which you see here. Without monitoring, you get a wide range um, of sound levels, each dot representing a different event, some quiet, some very loud. With monitoring, everything seems to cluster to that limit. Now, interestingly, I didn't find that when I repeated that test for large scale music festivals. Touring engineers don't seem to fall into this trap. They don't seem to mix to the limit, which is encouraging. So you, know, you have to kind of separate the small music venues and the large kind of touring um, uh, performances that I think they behave in different ways. Uh, and I should just point out within these studies uh, that I've done, venue acoustics are really important. Uh, this was from uh, data that uh, my colleague John Burton collected uh, when he was working with um, a very well-known international touring act for many years. Uh, he had about five years of data with the same show, uh, just in different venues. Uh, and this is just showing you a purpose-built music venue in Amsterdam versus an ice hockey arena. Same exact show, a few weeks apart. Uh, in Amsterdam, with good acoustics in the venue, John's typical mix level is 100 dB, I should say. In Amsterdam, he was hitting around 98 dB. In Russia, in the ice hockey arena, which had virtually no acoustic treatment, and I'm told the venue was pulled down about a month later uh, because it was structurally unsafe, uh, he was mixing at about 103, 104 dB to actually combat uh, the poor acoustics. Um, and that's the experience of many sound engineers. If you get good acoustics, they don't push the sound system as hard because it just sounds good. If it sounds horrible in the venue, um, then you run into quite a few problems. Um, from that same data set, we found that as the venue gets larger, the sound levels go down. Uh, the solid dots are indoor venues, the uh, open dots are outdoor venues. Um, and there's a clear reason for this. In smaller venues, if the band has a high stage level from the drums and the guitars and whatnot, then as a sound engineer, you're having to work against that to overcome that level from the stage. So the small venues, that's a big deal. If you're in a big arena or out in a big festival field, you don't really hear the stage uh, within reason. Um, and it's not so much an issue and you can mix more to your comfortable level. So there's practical and, and logical explanations for this data, but it's good to highlight at the very least. Okay, gonna run, uh, well, sum it up now. I know I'm about five minutes over time, I apologize. Um, in conclusion, this is challenging. It's extremely challenging to manage sound exposure and noise pollution um, at musical events. From a live engineer perspective, you have sort of this duality in your role. First of all, you're trying to design a sound system that safely delivers uncompromising, consistently high quality audio to everyone in the audience. But at the same time, you have to make sure you're limiting noise pollution in the surrounding areas. So it's this juggling act that, you're, that we're always constantly um, trying to get right sometimes succeeding, sometimes failing. Um, from the research I've done on it, there's no definitive solutions at present. Um, there's a lot of good practice out there that we can learn from. Um, and there's loads of great data from 40 plus years of live events that again, we can learn from. Uh, but there's significant amounts of research that are needed to fill the knowledge gaps, uh, some of which I've uh, identified uh, this afternoon. Uh, I will say, uh, if you're interested in uh, some of the stuff I've talked about, go look at the AES technical document, but also keep your eye on the Journal of the Audio Engineering Society. Um, in the last month's issue, we had our first part of a three-part series on this topic, uh, focusing on this new metric we've developed called Live Dynamic Range. Uh, either this month or January and February, uh, the, our paper on regulations, practices, and preferences will come out, which details um, the outcomes of this live sound engineer survey we conducted last year. And then the last bit, again, I think is planned for uh, January, February issue, um, is looking at improved tools and procedures uh, for actually achieving good sound level monitoring and keeping people safe in practice. And all of this work kind of was spurred by the uh, World Health Organization work on their global standard for safe listing venues. And a lot of this is feeding in to what uh, that standard eventually will be. So I'll end with this quote. Um, I like to end with this one because it was published over 40 years now in the Audio Engineering Society. And I don't think we've moved much from this point in 40 years. 
that says our, our civil liberties would be eroded by any government dictation or control of our leisure lifestyles, but this intervention can definitely occur sooner or later unless an aroused citizenship assumes the initiative to counteract the tidal wave sweeping our civilization into the insidious undercurrent of oral incapacitance. Uh, it is hoped that the profession can hear the whispered hint if it is not yet deafened into insensibility. So uh, I'll leave it at that. I'll thank you for your attention and I'm quite happy to stick around uh, for a bit longer if you have any questions. So if you have any questions, pop them into the chat. Uh, and like I said, I'll stick around for five, 10 more minutes. So thank you very much for your attention. I see Alex had a question from earlier. Um, are there any 3D waterfall plots evidence how much infrasound actually propagate to the audience during typical live events? Um, that's an interesting question, Alex, and I'm not sure about that. I know we have quite a bit of data, even one third octave data um, from live events. I've got some on my computer right now. Um, yeah, it'd be something to, to maybe dig into. Um, I'm not sure I've specifically looked at infrasound in the audience, um, how you say it, um, how you've put it. So yeah, that's maybe something for me to think about, maybe um, to have a chat about at some point. But yeah, good suggestion. Uh, Luis has asked for a CPD certificate of attendance. Um, I think uh, Zoe from, from UCAN uh, may be able to answer that question. I don't know if they do the CPD certificates for this. Uh, it's not something I can necessarily answer. Um, hi, Adam, I'll just jump in there if that's okay. Yeah, no, we, we don't offer that, I'm afraid, for, for these webinars. I will say, um, you know, if any of you want to reach out uh, to kind of further discuss these things, my email is on the screen. Uh, I mean, we have kind of a, a core group of people who've been researching this stuff, um, but we're always open to, to add more members to this, uh, either within the AES uh, or otherwise. Um, so do reach out if you have an interest in this or have something you can contribute. Um, you know, we're, we're very open um, to uh, new information and new ideas. I think Alistair is talking about IOA CPD. Yeah, I mean, I, I deal with the IOA CPD personally as a member. And yeah, I think they're pretty flexible with that. So if you don't have the CPD certificate, um, you can still self-declare and say you've attended. I, I, I've never found that to be an issue. Louis, I believe that you can have a, a YouTube channel that this is gonna turn up in. Uh, Zoe can correct me if I'm wrong. No, that's correct. Yeah, we have. Um, I can post the uh, the link in the chat. Okay. Well, if there are no other questions and it doesn't look like anything is coming up, um, then uh, I'll say thank you again for attending, and uh, hope you all have an excellent weekend and Christmas. See you all later.